Hello, and thank you for clicking on my video. Now, this story is another one in the series that I wrote set in Dinosaur Dell, which is a village entirely inhabited by dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles. If you've seen any of the other stories in my series, you'll know that my name is Alex, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I live here in Tasmania, which is the island off the south coast of Australia. You've probably also guessed by now that some of my favourite things in the world are dinosaurs, but some of my other favourite things are plants and flowers. And here in Tasmania we have a huge variety of native flowers, including the yellow one that you can see behind me, which is quite a common flower called fireweed ground cell. But we also have some of the rarest flowers in the world. The golfer's leek orchid only grows on one golf course right in the middle of Tasmania, nowhere else in the world. So this story has both dinosaurs and flowers. I hope you enjoy story number six, the story of Tracy Triceratops and the flowers. Under the volcano. And not too far from the sulphur springs and the pits of tar. In the middle of a forest of tall tree ferns, you'll find some houses where the footpath turns. This is where I live. Tell from the roars, my neighbours are all dinosaurs. I'm Alex the Alxosaurus. Hello. Now, once upon 70 million years ago, wait, which of the stories shall I tell about the dinosaurs living in Dinosaur Dell? The story of Tracy Triceratops and the flowers. In a small pink cottage by a tall, tall pine, there lives a very good friend of mine. At number two, nice and close to the shops, lives my friend Tracy Triceratops. The sweetest cottage on the street. She keeps it tidy, clean and neat. Her taste in furnishings is chic. She has an eye for an antique. Like this one, it's a timeless classic, dating from the late Triassic. And her front garden, lush and green, is quite the prettiest I've seen. Potted palms and ferns crisscross a lawn of soft and dark green moss. The envy of any dinosaur, especially the one who lives next door. Now... One day, Tracy was sat in her parlour, feeling very content. Just that morning, she had bought some lovely new ornaments for her wall. Three pottery pterodactyls with their wings outstretched. Quite beautiful. As she was admiring them, the post arrived through her door with a thud. How exciting! She'd forgotten that today was the first of the month. Her copy of Vague magazine had arrived. She loved looking at the pictures of the glamorous homes and gardens of the famous dinosaurs inside. And this month, a feature on the country house of Lady Albertina Styracosaurus had been promised. She was flipping through the magazine as quickly as she could, looking for the pictures, when her eye was caught instead by this article. Vague Magazine's Homes and Gardens Competition is your home gracious, spacious, and cretaceous, or a Mesozoic mess? Is your garden a Jurassic Park, or more of a land that time forgot? Our celebrity judge is coming to Dinosaur Dell to look for a beautiful home and garden. If that's your home and garden, you could win a two-week spa break for you and a friend at an exclusive resort on the shores of the stunning Tethys Sea as well as the chance to have your home and garden featured in Vague's Summer Issue. 
Well, Tracy was terribly excited. She noted down the address under the article and went at once to post a reply, saying that she thought her home and garden would make a perfect entry for the vague competition. She hadn't even gotten to the garden gate when she saw her neighbour, Stella Coelophysis, who lived next door at number four. Oh, good morning, said Stella. No need to ask where you're off to in such a hurry. I've already posted my entry. If there's one house in Dinosaur Dell bound to win that competition, it's number four. I've just got Sydney to give my garden a good going over. Tracy looked over the fence where Stella's husband was pruning a huge fern. I think the garden will definitely sway the judge's decision. Well, I can't stand here gossiping. See you later. Tracy looked at the garden next door. Stella was right. It was bound to win. Tracy's garden was full of beautiful ferns and palms, pines and cycads, but it was all so... green. But Stella's garden was a riot of colour. In the middle was a wooden table and chairs, painted light blue, with a spotted parasol shading them. The rockery was dotted with little china garden nomingias, wearing little red and yellow hats. In one corner, under a large tree fern, there were three stone statues of frolicking tyrannosaurs and a large white bird bath in which a pair of Archaeopteryx were splashing. Tracy walked slowly to the post box. How can I win against such a beautifully colourful garden? She thought to herself, sadly. She still felt glum that evening as she finished reading her book. Usually a chapter of frills and swoon made her feel much happier. She sighed as she covered her glowworm light. <sighs> but just then, her eye was drawn to the window. Through the window, far off in the darkness of the night outside, she saw a falling star. One, two, three, four, five falling stars. And she did what everyone does when they see a falling star. She closed her eyes and wished. Maybe you can guess what she wished for. The next day, as she went for her morning walk, she met Stella Coelophysis again at her garden gate. Oh, how very green your garden is looking today, Tracy, she said. Very nice, I suppose. Terribly popular in the Carboniferous period. But it's a little unfashionable nowadays, don't you think? We prefer something a little more colourful, don't we, Sydney? Stella's husband didn't reply. He was too busy sticking some eye-catching bright pink wooden pterosaurs into the lawn. Tracy thought that she would take quite a long walk, and was soon out in the forest, far from Dinosaur Dell. All of a sudden, she came to a great big hole. And another, and another, and another, and another. They must have been the craters left by the falling stars she had seen. A week later, she found herself walking the same way through the forest. Tracy had managed to avoid Stella that morning, as she was too busy supervising Sydney, who was sticking whirligigs around the trees. They were shaped like little Archaeopteryxes, and when the wind blew, their blue and orange wings whirled around. Tracy was so distracted, she didn't even notice she had reached the craters. But her jaw dropped when she did. Growing in the craters were plants of every colour imaginable. Flowers. The first flowers that had ever been seen. You see, 70 million years ago, there were no flowers. Only the green cycads, ferns, palms and pines that grew in Tracy and Stella's gardens. But now, here, there were all sorts. Flowers as red as waratahs, as orange as bitter peas, and as yellow as wattle blossoms as blue as forget-me-nots, as white as magnolias, and as violet as, well, violets. With delight, Tracy picked an armful and hurried back home. She placed them here and there in the soil around her garden. And you can imagine what happened when Stella Coelophysis saw them. She turned quite green with envy. Tracy was too kind to remind her that green was a very unfashionable colour nowadays. 
And for a few days, Tracy's garden was even more colourful than Stella's. But then, disaster struck. It was only a few weeks away from the visit of the vague magazine judge, and the flowers Tracy had picked had begun to wilt and fall apart. Stella could hardly hide her glee. Tracy didn't know what to do. Then suddenly she remembered someone who might be able to help. Her cousin, Zeke Zuniceratops. She hadn't seen him for ever so long. You see, Zeke was a farmer, and he and Tracy didn't really have that much in common. He wasn't one for antiques and ornaments, and she wasn't very keen on getting her claws too dirty. She always wore pretty gloves when trimming the ferns in the garden, you see. Zeke was quite surprised when Tracy arrived at his farm, where he grew tasty berries and cones that he sold at the market in Dinosaur Dell. He listened as Tracy told him the story of the strange plants she had found. But when she told him about picking them, he shook his head. Hooey, no, Tracy. You mustn't pick them all. You must leave them for other dinosaurs to enjoy. But I'll show you a way that we can do that and have some of them in your garden. Show me the way. Tracy led Zeke to the craters, and he was delighted by the plants. He'd never seen such a variety. As red as roses, as orange as marigolds, as yellow as everlastings, as blue as bluebells, as white as snowgum blossoms, as lilac as, well, lilacs. He searched carefully amongst the plants, choosing only those where the flowers had shriveled away. But those ones have died, said Tracy, sadly. Aha, uh -huh. but had they, said Zeke, and showed her a paw full of tiny seeds. They hurried back to Tracy's pretty cottage, and after she had made them some tea, Zeke and Tracy took the seeds out into the garden, and he showed her how to push the seeds into the soil around the trees and under the moss. As he was doing so, Stella came walking past. Behind her came Sidney, struggling under the weight of a huge stone sculpture of a plesiosaurus. Oh, goodness me, said Stella when she saw Tracy. What are you doing with that trade dinosaur? Oh, you won't win the vague competition by grubbing around in the dirt, you know. Not when we have this. She gestured to the sculpture. It shoots water out of its mouth like a fountain, doesn't it, Sydney? Sydney couldn't reply, but it hardly mattered, as Stella hadn't waited for him to answer. Oh, the celebrity judge will be so impressed. And she disappeared into her house. Zeke stayed with Tracy for a few days. She grew ever more anxious as there were no flowers in her garden. The judge wouldn't even know that the seeds were there. But as the sun rose, it gave the seeds light. And as the rain fell during the night, it watered the little seeds. And the soil was full of the nutrients the seeds needed to grow. And one morning, Tracy noticed that where she and Zeke had buried the seeds, there were now little shoots appearing. But to her dismay, they were still green. Be patient, said Zeke. And the little seedlings spread out tiny roots that drew up more water, and they put out tiny leaves that caught the sunlight and made food for the plants. And the roots went deeper, and the leaves grew larger, and the seedlings grew taller, and then, just a few days before the competition was to take place, flowers began to appear in all colours of the rainbow. I hope they'll last until the judge gets here, said Tracy, worriedly. Well, they might, said Zeke, with a smile. But even if those ones don't, you know what happens? The flower blooms, and the bees and butterflies come, and take the pollen from the flower and carry it to other flowers. Then the flowers start to turn into little fruits, and the fruits contain little seeds. Then you can plant the seeds, and it starts all over again. That way, you'll always have flowers in your garden. Oh, thank you, Zeke, 
said Tracy, and gave him a hug. It was the morning of the competition, and Tracy's garden was beautiful. The sun shone on the flowers that Zeke had planted for her. As red as fire orchids, as orange as copper cups, as yellow as buttercups, as blue as sun orchids, as white as lilies, and as pink as, well, pinks. Tracy's house was the last on the list, and she and Zeke stood proudly in the garden as the celebrity judge left Stella's house next door and came to the gate. The judge was no less than Lady Albertina the Styracosaurus. Oh, what a beautiful garden, she cried in delight. Such beautiful colours, and I've never seen plants like these. You must show me around. I think my cousin Zeke should do that, said Tracy. After all, he planted them. And Zeke offered Lady Albertina his arm. Stella Coelophysis peered over the fence. Oh, she didn't even notice our fountain, she said in dismay. And now look at her, losing her head over those things. I think they're pretty, said her husband, so distracted that the watering can he was holding had dribbled water all over a pair of Stella's potted palms. Oh, put a sock in it, Sydney, said Stella. You talk far too much. She glared as Tracy showed Lady Albertina into her cottage. Oh, and watch what you're doing, Sydney. You just wet my plants. A crowd had gathered, all very keen to see who'd win the vague magazine Holiday by the Tethys Sea. Everyone wanted to know, including me. To whom would the prize go? We knew whom when we saw Tracy's garden all in bloom. Red and yellow, orange, blue, pink and violet, lilac too. Those flowers took our breath away. Lady Albertina appeared to say, The luxury spa break for two weeks is Tracy's. And Tracy said, And Zeke's. And everyone will have the chance to see these beautiful new plants. Your home and garden just must be seen in a feature in Vague magazine. And now, there's really nothing more to tell. That's the story of how flowers came to Dinosaur Dell. Here's a little bit more about my story. This story is all about Tracy, who is a Triceratops, a dinosaur you probably know very well already. Triceratops was a Ceratopsian, a type of horned dinosaur, and she could grow very large, up to 26 feet long. Her skull alone, with its large frill and three horns, could be up to two metres or seven feet in length. Triceratops lived in the Cretaceous period, about 65 million years ago. She is the official state dinosaur of Wyoming, in the USA. There were lots of other Ceratopsian dinosaurs, like Zuniceratops. He was a lot smaller than Triceratops, only eight feet long. His fossil was discovered in 1996 by Christopher, the eight-year-old son of the paleontologist Douglas Wolfe. Styracosaurus was another larger Ceratopsian dinosaur. Her name means spiked reptile because of the six spikes on her frill. She also had a horn on her nose that could grow up to two feet long and six inches wide. This story is also all about flowers. You probably see flowers every day, but for most of the time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, they didn't exist. They only appeared 140 million years ago. Before that, there were only things like ferns, cycads and conifers, or plants with cones. Flowers are very delicate, and rarely make good fossils. 
but the earliest flower fossil found is from a water plant called Montesia. It was discovered in Spain in 2015. Some other plants with flowers that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs that still exist today are laurel, fig, sycamore and magnolia. Scientists also now believe that early types of grass, like bamboo, appeared at the same time as the last dinosaurs. They are still unsure about exactly how flowering plants evolved. One rather silly theory used to be that their seeds had arrived from space, on meteorites or comets that landed on Earth. Flowers come in all shapes and sizes. The largest flower in the world is called the corpse flower, and it's well over 2 metres or 7 feet tall, and 4 metres or 12 feet around. It's also the world's stinkiest flower, as the smell attracts flies that help to pollinate it. Some flowers have had strange histories too. In Holland, in the 1600s, there was a craze for tulips. Unusual varieties of the flower were so highly prized that the bulbs were worth more than gold was. In Victorian England, collectors would pay very high prices for certain types of orchid flowers. The craze was called the Orchidilirium. Flower Salad Some flowers are delicious. You should only ever pick flowers in the garden, and not in the wild. But if you have any pumpkin blossoms, thyme, borage, lavender, nasturtiums, dandelions, violets and pansies in your garden, ask a tame grown-up to pick some for you, so long as there are enough left for the bees and butterflies. You can add them to a salad to brighten it up, or you can freeze them in ice cubes to make pretty drinks. But always make sure that your grown-up checks that the flowers are ones that are safe to eat. Colour changing flowers. You can see how plants draw water up through tissue in their stems called xylem, which transports the water all the way to the flowers. Ask your grown up to buy some bright white carnations and fill some jars with water mixed with liquid food colouring in bright colours. If your grown up cuts the stems of the carnations and puts them in the jars, you'll see how the plants draw up the water and the colours of the flowers change. Well, thank you for joining me for a story from Dinosaur Dell. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it and telling it. Now one day I'd obviously like to turn all of my Dinosaur Dell stories into storybooks that anyone can read at home, perhaps using some of the character drawings and photos of Tasmania that you saw on the screen while I was reading the story. I'd love to hear from you, so if you enjoyed the story, or you'd just like to say hello, or even better, tell me who your favourite dinosaur is, please let me know in the comments below, or do visit my website www.alexscottfairley.com, and hopefully I'll see you next time for another story from Dinosaur Dell. Bye for now!